Hey guys, it is Chad here from the Battle Warrior Podcast, and I'm just letting all you listeners know that the Battle Warrior Podcast episodes will be available across all podcast platforms, guys. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this brand new episode today. Please beware, the voice in your head is a threat. All time. <laughs> I hop in an hour early. I'm like, I'm ready for this. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> I'm fucking sitting at Walmart. And I'm like, I know. I, so I went to buy a life to donate, get gas money. And yeah. I'm looking, I'm like, shit, she's out already. <laughs> right? You're like, I got you on at 1130. I'm like, man, I was ready to go this morning. I got up at eight. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Let's do this. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm hitting the same spot. I'm trying to. I don't know, for some odd reason this morning, I'm not firing on all cylinders quite yet. You kind of, you know, you get those days where you wake up and it's kind of like, you're yeah. like, let's go. And then there's days it's like, okay, wait a minute here. Man, I I, I've, <laughs> I went back. I'm, I just completed my second week back at the gym. And uh, there's there was two days this week where I just had nothing in me after that. And I was like, ooh. Well, so yes. So good though. I love okay, I, I, typically I'm a... Well, we'll see how my schedule, how long we go, because both of us could talk forever. But um, I do want to hit the gym again today. So that I usually go six days a week. Nice. Okay. And what's happening now is I know I need to train for an ultra marathon next year, but I am eating like I want to lift weights. Oh, yeah. So when I went, when I run running yesterday, well, for, okay, I really don't get, I care about my weight, but just make sure it's in a range. Like, I'm not like, oh, my God, I, get, I don't give a shit, right? Yeah. Um, I looked at, I jumped on the scale. I'm like, oh, boy, this is not good. You're like, whoops, maybe I should care a little bit. <laughs> and, and I'm You're in like, shape. Hey, plumpy. <laughs> yeah, I'm in shape. I'm fine. It's yeah. just uh, when I ran, I ran a mile, almost two miles yesterday. And then I'm like huffing and puffing. I'm like, fuck, mm-hmm. like, how did I? Because I, my last marathon I ran was at the end of September. So I should not huh. like yeah. have that quick of a turnaround. And uh, I, I swear the winter months, it comes up on you so quiet. You don't realize it. I really, truly think it's the change of like how early it gets dark. Because that blows my mind. Oh, absolutely. I'm thinking, it, I'm thinking it's like eight, nine o'clock and it's seven o'clock. And then for me, I get, because I'm such a go, 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 I have a super bad habit of like going all day without eating. But here's the deal is if I didn't break my fast at 10 a.m. with a coffee, that would be perfect actually, because Mm -hmm. I did a full like 16 hour fast and that would, that's perfect for my body type and me being a female and my age. But I break my fast with that stupid coffee and then go all day with nothing. So I'm like, I need to stop doing that one thing. And it will, tur- but now I'm working out again. So I'm like, I got to get that protein shake in. We're good. So once I figure out my right schedule, I'm going to go back to intermittent fasting because that changed my whole life. Yeah. And, and I need to get back into that because what was happening when I was running is I was burning so much and you get on like a jacked up routine that mm-hmm. you are run. Well, and I'm going to use this for example, because I kind of monitored okay i'm not ocd on my working out i read like if i want to know something it's like okay shopify like we're doing all the mastermind shit and stuff it's like oh yeah. i need to know more and then i'm like shit i don't know more i need to know more and and yeah. i get like you and uh all of a sudden like i'm sitting there looking one day and i paid attention i looked down i'm like holy shit i just burned 1200 calories doing like 11 mile run and i'm like someone's like why don't you do fat like a couple of my buddies in 365 he's like do want you do fast i'm like how the fuck am i gonna go do a fast yeah. And then and then turn around, eat all so like eat three twice a day, whatever. Yeah. And whatever I just ate, I burn in like a two hour you burn run. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're gonna turn into the rock, you know, when he has his big meal of the day and it's like 
45 pizzas and 17 whole chickens. And I'm just like, you know, he's burning so much to take that in. Like it's nothing. Oh, I, I, you know how many days I crave pizza right now? I haven't had it. Like, and, and we're going to sit and talk shit a little bit about that. But like the last week, all I've been craving is like, and it's not the, okay, so I'm in a college town. So you got like the toppers, you got the, but the one that I'm craving for some odd reason is like the Pizza Hut freaking meat lovers pan pizza. Like the one that yeah. just is going to take a shotgun and just shoot you in the stomach. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much oil and grease when you lift oh, it up, it just drips down. Yeah. That's I don't, so I'm, I'm vegan. Obviously I don't do the pizza. I have become accustomed to eating pizza without any cheese because most vegan cheese is awful. Yeah. So I will get a pizza with just sauce and some veggies and people are like, what the fuck is that? And I'm like, it's actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, just the way you look at it. So you got the crust, it's like a gnarly Chicago style pizza. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and just, I like bread. I I mean, body built by bread right here. So I'm just like, <laughs> give me some of that bread. Put some sauce on that bread. And I am good. <laughs> it's true, man. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, speaking of that, did you ever get raised up in the um, sugar, cinnamon, freaking butter bread type of situation? Where like you'd mm -hmm. have. Yeah, like that was the. So I grew up super poor. So that's like, that was fancy. Like to put the sugar. Yeah. You were I'm doing you are doing something and like literally I grew up on food stamps and the other day I was talking to somebody that is definitely not in their thirties. And I was talking about, you know, being a child and feeling that shame going mm. into the grocery store and from a really small town. And I remember being a small child and I remember the looks the cashiers would give us. And, and she was like, she made some comment like, Oh yeah, the debit card. I said, no, sweetheart. We had, paper food stamps we had to yeah, like, like a, checks we had to take I, them I out wasn't of the on booklets. it but i've seen plenty of them yeah, yeah. so I, that's where i'm from I, you know i was born in 1984 so i am from the era of paper food stamps and ripping them out and counting them out and everyone looking at you and judging you like you're just such scum of the earth and she was like paper food stamps i'm like y'all really don't know nothing about what we grew <laughs> up in like i'm talking about dial up internet boo 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 you, you know the, the 17 hours Netscape cds shipped to your house for the internet <laughs> now okay so and check this out though do you remember the like the cds the the program where you could get a bunch of cds for like a penny or a dollar yeah it was called get, yeah yeah it was called the, bmg yeah yeah they, they would get, yeah yeah yeah, yeah the get blue these CDs. catalogs in and like you get, could get the membership well that was my first business so my dad let me use his credit card and really he was letting me use his credit card because my dad and I never had a good relationship and we we definitely were separated and he was trying to win me over. So he was like, oh, I'll let you use my credit card. And I was like, well, shoot, let me be smart about this. So I started purchasing these CDs on BMG. I would get them in. I'd burn them so I would have the copy and then I would post them like new on eBay and sell them like 15, 17 bucks a pop. And I'm, you know, 17, 18, 19 years old making a from account. Maine, you know, not really knowing anything. And I'm just flipping these CDs, making money like it's nothing. <laughs> so I was loving it. <laughs> well, what was the, oh, here's the thing that, and me and you are like a year different. So like all the shit in high school was pretty much the same, like the disturbs mm -hmm. and the corns and all that stuff, like at that yeah. time. But like, um, what was the one? Cheater boxes? You remember those like on the TV where people like the neighbors would get cheater boxes where they would get like free cable. They know like there was. Like oh, see, I grew up on in the mountains, so that that wasn't as popular. Like a lot of the regular popular things we had no idea. Like when I started first gauging my ears, it was by accident. I had no idea people did that. I saw <laughs> I saw a Rob Thomas music video and I saw he had these hoops with his ball on. I'm like, that's super cool. I go into Claire's and I find these hoops and I'm like, great, I buy it. Go home and I'm like trying to shove it in. It won't fit. 30 minutes later, I use all the power in my physical body to push this thing through. And I was like, why is it so painful? And then I look it up and I realize, oh shit, I just gauged my friggin' ear. I just ripped. So I was like, well, I guess I got to do the other one. Well, <laughs> but he, like, oh, keep going. No, it was just like because of where I'm from, we were so away from so much. Like, yeah, yeah. We might as well have been Amish in many ways. And we were poor, so we didn't have 
um, cable for the most part. Like I remember my first music video was Michael Jackson's Thriller, but I was also like 16 or something like that. It was like a ridiculous time. I wasn't that old. I was like 10. But I remember seeing that and being like, what is this? Yeah. And like, everyone, that's everyone how... freaked out too. Like even yeah. the parents and stuff, they're like, just, just calm down, calm down. I'm yeah. Like, Don't watch that. It's evil. I'm, I'm like, like, what? Like, yeah. like right now you do know in my like cd collection i got like slipknot and all the heavy freaking metal <laughs> shit but yeah you're sitting here telling me i can't like yeah. like be careful how you watch the like, like, really? oh yeah my, <laughs> my we went through this um interesting christian period where my mom is like you can't listen to marilyn manson you can't listen to eminem you can't watch harry potter so like i just barely watched harry potter for the first time um and i was absolutely listening to eminem without her knowing <laughs> so <laughs> I'm that like, was girl. Such a good CD too. It was so good, all of his stuff. What, what yeah. was it? It was uh was uh, what was the first one? Slim Shady LP. Yeah, and then you had the Marshall Mathers. Yeah. Which is the one that he got. I just remember he got trouble and when he was it was the um same album that was talking about Haley ended up like rapping on it at the beginning, which was like six years old, but it was the one where him and Elton John did the Stan. Oh, they, yeah, that, Stan came with. And that was the one that, like, he blew up with, like, the, the blonde hair. But then after that, everyone yeah. was like, yo, dude, you're, like, telling everyone to go kill themselves. Yeah, well, he got really dark. He was addicted to all those pills and stuff. And he talks about it. He was like, I barely remember that. And when you hear his interviews of how much, like, pills he was putting in his body, he was like, I can't believe I'm still alive. No, I, I love that that dude turned his life around. And what I also love about Eminem is how good of a dad he is. Like that dude was is completely focused on being a dad and still is. And I think that that really kind of shows you like regardless of where you come from, regardless of how baby mama is and all that, like dude is on a whole other level when it comes to being a parent well and hey and i'm like to be brutally honest i've seen pictures of Haley, and she's actually beautiful but in general yeah. like yes it, yes yeah. <laughs> so he's he's been having to hold people back like what you just say about my daughter i'm like you do it bro <laughs> there there is something about and and i read it when she graduated like because i'm in wisconsin so michigan's fucking mm -hmm. you know six seven hours away and uh something got snuck out where she was graduating and then she was going to, to Ann Arbor or one of the Michigan, like Michigan state or something, whatever mm -hmm. the situation was. And she ended up graduating high school and they were all waiting for him to be in the stadium while she was graduating. But he ended up going in the press box and they're like, why were you up there? He's like, I saw it. He goes, it, he goes, I was there. I was present, yeah. but he's like, this image wasn't about me being at my daughter's yes. graduation. He goes, yeah. I wanted her to fulfill everything. And he's like, yeah. she knew I was there. It's just, yeah. You know, cause no, she, yeah. Super supportive and doesn't make it about himself ever. No, no. It's, it's, it's incredible. And yet people are like, Ooh, Eminem. I'm like, you should really look at this dude. You could learn a lot from him because he came from nothing. Everything was against him. He's a white dude in, you know, the black, you know, community doing black people music or however they wanted to put it. And fucking did it through everything I, that's one thing and and i didn't notice that i should have a picture of him up in my room because i have bob marley james headfield and hendrix mm -hmm. and, the, and the the reason why i did this were these guys were all the pioneers and outliers in their industry all well, versus dave mustaine i mean like I'm, we have to add a few more on that metal side but um like these guys opened up showed you soul on the guitars they showed you their yep. own selves and yeah, I, I don't know who what I know one died of not being clean, but um, well, I mean, look at Hendrix. Hendrix is left handed and learned how to play with a right handed guitar. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big music fan. So right before Hendrix um, passed, he was starting to do some crazy ass shit. He was bringing in whole on orchestras and was going to slowly start changing um, a bit of his style to something even more melodic and it would have been next level and then of course he passed and it's like crap what what could have that dude could have done just ugh. well and, and he wasn't the only one that was playing so uh 15, i think out of that circle came albert king which played the flying v backwards so he he flipped the flying v upside down which is a yep. blues guy mm-hmm Albert taught Steve Ray Vaughn how to play. 
Mm-hmm. So like those two were all parallel with each other. And then now was a Kenny Wayne Shepherd learned from Steve Ray Vaughn or something like yeah. they're all. And I'm like, motherfuckers. <laughs> like, right. But, and you can tell though, you can tell that they were, were trained by somebody simply different. I mean, you only have a handful of those type. It's crazy when you just talk about success in any industry, you'd have right. like five core people that are at the top that will always be just simply the greatest i'm gonna get shot at by you right now but she's very good at rock like if you give her rock music she's absolutely phenomenal if she can like and i'm not i know you have a southern accent but she can she can remove it and she can sing rock absolutely beautiful and that's miley oh like, first she, of all people she, say my voice when i talk is like miley miley is incredible her she's vocals abs- oh my god yeah but people don't want to give her that credit because, you know, she was young and decided to do all this extra sexy shit and was raunchy. And everyone's like, oh, my gosh. And it's like, y'all, just because she's, she was she's Hannah Montana. Montana. Like, she's the Montana. Like, new Montana. Yeah. Ma- Ma- yeah. Madonna. Thank you. Madonna. <laughs> no, she really is. But, like, in her own way. Because I always, I like Madonna, but I've always felt like Madonna's tried a little too hard she's on been, purpose. She, yeah, she's been you different know? since high school. You got to understand yeah. where she came from. Yeah. So like a family friend, my mom's best friend actually was in school with her at high school. So she's like, I seen her from, you know, 16 yeah. on. And she's like, she always had uh hairy armpits and always was opposite on the cheer. Like she goes, that's yeah. just, that's Madonna. Yeah. Yeah. That, and now she, and now she's gay. I'm like, welcome to the community. I'm pretty sure you've kind of always been wishy-washy, <laughs> but welcome. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, you know, Rob Halford, we kind of knew when you were up on stage already. <laughs> Right? Like, it's so funny. It's like, okay, like, we knew that. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a few other ones that I think that are kind of, like, hiding it, holding it back. But, like, I'm not. I'm straight. But in general, like, you could tell. Like, but here's the thing. The hotel that we were staying at, you notice, and let's see if I have a picture of him. You know, there was always, like, an old dude that was in pictures with, like, Barbara Streisand and stuff. Okay, I'm going to show you this quick. I should just say fucking fill it. Hold on here. Where is it? Like, this is the greatest podcast recording ever. <laughs> yeah, we did, like it gets to that point where we just say fuck it. Don't even put the intro in. But I will dump it. <laughs> All right, where are we at? Let Random take... conversations with Ashley. <laughs> oh, nice. You got me and you clicked right when we were next to each other. You're like, you're fuck what? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I need to find it here. Hold on. Yeah. Because a little flamboyant. A... Yeah. A little flamboyant. Yeah. A little Elton. He was a little more extreme than Elton John. What was crazy, though, is like people didn't think Elton was gay or something. I don't get that. It was pretty obvious to me, but it was back in the day where it wasn't. I mean, even for me, like I didn't come out as being gay until I was 21. I moved far away from home. And even more so, I didn't know what gay was. I had no concept of anything. And I remember being five and not being sexually attracted to women because I'm five, but having this interesting pull towards women. And it grew, it would grow. And mm-hmm. I like remember having like crushes on my teachers or something. And then in middle school, my uncle came up and came out as being gay to my family. And so my mom and my dad came home and they tell me my uncle is gay. And by they my dad does it in like a negative way like this is really bad and I remember being in middle school and realizing for the first time what I was yeah I was like oh that's a thing that's I'm gay and I remember going oh but this seems really bad so you need to pretend that you're not gay so I as soon as I found out what I was I immediately knew I couldn't be that in the environment I was probably I'm gonna say I was 10 or 11 and I, and I knew then that, like, I was not going to be accepted in my family if I was gay. So I tried to hide it. I tried to not be gay for a while. <laughs> Didn't work. Uh, and then when I moved to Nashville, which the only reason why I moved to Nashville was that same uncle. I graduated high school in 2002. And I had been a nanny for two years. Didn't have my driver's license. Was still living at home. My parents were separated, which was kind of good. Because um, my I lived in a very abusive, volatile um, home. Both my parents are narcissists. Um, And so after I graduated, he was like, listen, you're not going to do anything in Maine, like move 
move down here, go to school, get a job, whatever it is. And without thinking, I was like, I'm gone. And I, three days after I turned 21, I moved to Nashville and it changed my life forever. And then a few months later I came out and everyone was like, duh. And I'm like, whatever. (laughs) I fucking told you. (laughs) My, my mom's literal reaction was, I knew you've been weird since you were three. And I'm like, thank you, mother. (laughs) Needless to say, I don't have a relationship with my mother today. And my father and I have a relationship where we mildly respectfully tolerate each other. (laughs) No, and and, and that's, um, you did exactly what a lot of people are afraid to do. You took that jump and you're like, I gotta go. Like, I gotta go. I, here, I knew I had to. So my first suicide attempt, I was 13. My sister, she was 10. Uh, This was the same year. I don't recall when she attempted hers, but she attempted hers afterwards. When I was 13, I had had enough. I had had enough of being bullied at home, being bullied at school, not having friends, being weird. I couldn't escape it. I couldn't escape it. The only time I could escape it was when I played sports because I was always the best and everyone would cheer on me and everyone knew that if Ashley was up to bat or if the ball was hit to Ashley, everything was good. So I would have these few moments of feeling celebrated. And I loved that. And I didn't know how to make that always. I I was a kid that didn't smile. I was a kid that if I had to speak in front of the class, I would be sick that day or I wouldn't do the assignment. And now I do Facebook lives. Now I get paid to speak. Like I'm doing all these things where it's all the things that Ashley was never in that situation. So after attempting suicide at 13, I was actually at a marching band competition. I was a Band-Aid, so I carried the stuff onto the field. Um, I had this total breakdown. Somebody made fun of me in front of everyone, and it just snapped me, and I was done. I was like, I'm so sick of this. So I took a bunch of pills and got a little scared, told my friend. I remember four adults tackled me to the ground because I was running. They strapped me to a gurney. I'm 13 years old. Um, They strapped me to a gurney. They send me to the hospital. I have to call my mom. And I call my mom, it's a Saturday night. And my mom goes, I'm so disappointed in you. Your father is totally upset. I was six hours away. She was like, you know, we have church in the morning. Your father has to drive six hours. She goes, it's in your best interest to not say a word to him. So I didn't say a word to him. He picked me up at the hospital. We never spoke about it. Six, eight, eight months later, I attempted again. It was four years ago. My sister, my dad and I, and her kids and my gram and everybody is in the same room. We haven't been in the same room for like 12 years and we're sitting there and I have no idea how it even came up, but we were talking about suicide. And I mentioned, I said, yeah, dad, I was like, the first time I attempted, what was that day you picked me up at the hospital and my dad turned ghost white. And he said, what did you say? And his eyes start like watering up. And my dad goes, you tried to kill yourself. He had no idea. Yeah. Because my mom told me to never say anything. So we never spoke about it. And so for 22 years, my dad didn't know that he picked me up at the hospital because I attempted to kill myself. Zero clue. Yeah. So that was kind of the environment I grew up in. And the other part, I was telling somebody the other day, for six months, I was writing notes to two friends about how I was cutting myself, how I wanted to die, how I was miserable. My mom was reading those notes. My mom was reading those notes, keeping it to herself. That's how sick my mother is mentally. She's a very sick person. And so when I was given the opportunity to get the hell out, to me, it wasn't a risk. Staying was the risk because I knew if I stayed, number one, I was going to have to not be gay which meant I was going to probably get pregnant by some asshole, have kids that I wasn't going to like, and I probably was not going to survive. Like, I, I feel like I can confidently say if I stayed in Maine, I would have successfully killed myself and I wouldn't be here today. I just wouldn't. So for me, when I was given that opportunity, that was the ticket I needed. And it, there was no, it wasn't a yes or no. It was yes. That's the only option there. And I moved to Nashville and it was a, it was, a total shocker, culture shocker. I'd never been around melanin people, really. I'd never been around Asians, Hispanics, nothing. And I remember within my first week, I was sitting down at the McDonald's and I was the only white person in there. And I loved it because I was like, 
this is life. This is the real world. This is the stuff I want to be experiencing. And I've had terrible situations in Nashville and I've had beautiful, you know, situations in Nashville, but this is really my second home and where I grew up to be a true adult. Um, and so for me, that wasn't a risk at all. A risk would have been staying and taking like seriously taking that risk of even being alive. And, and the thing that I was uh, digging into even further was you feel it before you make the jump. It's like, okay, hey, I might do this. I might do this. And all of a sudden you're just like, you got to go. You, you have to. The thing, see, the thing is, is if we give ourselves time to talk ourselves out of it, we will. So if we put ourselves in a situation where there's not an option, so like going to the gym, every day we don't go to the gym, that's a choice that we make. Now, am I going to be tired during the gym? Yes. Am I going to be tired after the gym? Yes. But have I ever felt miserable in my soul going to the gym? No, I feel amazing, but we will do and say anything to talk ourselves out of it. We'll talk ourselves out of, cause like, okay, I am bipolar. I have bipolar two. I have clinical OCD. I have PTSD. I probably have a few other things sprinkled in there and they are all huge challenges, but everyone is my superpower. We were talking about having energy before I was on bipolar medicine. It didn't matter if I was, if I stayed up till 5 a.m., I was going to be up by 5.30, 6 o'clock, ready mm -hmm. to go with all the energy. And I'm going to come and I'm going to be happy and I'm going to be good. And woo, right? That's one of the beauties, that that manic high, that stuff that's going to keep going. And then there are day. there's been days where I felt like I couldn't lift my arms. Now, this was before I was medicated because I recently found out I was bipolar. I was recently diagnosed with bipolar about two years ago. My whole life, I was misdiagnosed. I was told I was manic depressive, um, that I had anxiety issues. Um, and so I had insomnia. I had anxiety. Again, talking myself out of all these situations because I had no tools to manage. I would just be freaking out. And I was so used to all the bad things, you know, all the, the critiques and not being accepted that you'd freak yourself out. And what you don't realize is as adults, we do that. Like you get invited to a party and you don't yeah. feel great. And you spend the whole day coming up with all the reasons why you're not going to go. And then you may regret some, or you may tell yourself it's great, but you don't know what you just missed out going to that party. And I'm not talking about a raver. Like last night, um, we went to this incredible Christmas party. It was in an $8 million home. There was ladies, fake boobies everywhere. I was not upset about it. <laughs> all the plastic uh, surgery I mean, I, known I, to I, men. Honestly, I wouldn't either, so... I was a big fan. I'm like, hello, your boobs look great. Uh, I could totally get away with that too. But I could have talked myself out of that. And how many times have I talked myself out of that? But you never know whether it's a personal or a business or anything. You never know what you're taking away from yourself in all the situations. And it's as simple as I'm going to go to a coffee shop today instead of work from home. Every time I decide to go to a coffee shop, I meet some random person and a conversation happens and it's either you're a new referral partner, you need a loan, you need coaching, you need a friend. And it, and it always turns into something great. But it's these little things that we continuously hold ourselves back and we think, oh, it's not. Or we call it self-care. I get having to be separated from humans. I get needing quiet and taking a bath. But we also have started using self-care in this toxic way to give us an excuse to not do things. Exactly. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to tap into that because this last year, it took me a year where I was at right now. Um, I had a pretty major blow up at, a, at an entrepreneurship group in town here. I, I'm like you, man. We're a lone wolf, you know, no mm -hmm. pun intended. We, we like to do our own things. And yeah. uh, <clears throat> you just kind of butt heads and I'm like, fuck this. And mm -hmm. ended up coming in. And I do a lot of my business out of my studio here, which is great. But the only downfall is we're such in a global platform that we can get sucked into this world on yeah. the Zoom world. And yep. ended up being like this last month, um, I did something for like the local... I went to a Christmas party or something that was brought on by like Chamber. Just said, I'm like, hey, I need to get back out. Yep. And 
it was in a bar, which I am sober, which is not really a good mix to begin with. But sure. in general, you have to relearn going back out. So if you're dealing with yeah. people with business, you have to meet at the establishment. You don't have to do it. Yeah, it's so crazy how 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 many people do the bar thing. It's it's wild. Oh, it fucking yeah. drives me insane. <laughs> yeah, coming from a recovery addict, but um, yeah. Like just, I would much prefer to be at a place that's not a bar. I do not need to drink to, I mean, we talked a little, I was an alcoholic for three years. Um, when I talk about my alcoholism, I'm a little careful with it because I say that I was a situational alcoholic. I had never had issues with drugs or alcohol before. I dated a female for a total of six years. She was very much narcissistic and controlling. I nearly lost my life because it was a domestic violence situation. And she started drinking so consistently. I got sick of being the sober one. So I was like, just going to drink with you. And so I would drink with her. And I remember like, oh my gosh, we worked at Nissan. North America. I assembled cars. She assembled trucks. We would work overnight, third shift. We would get home by seven and by seven 15, I would be drunk taking straight shots of vodka, just shots of vodka all day. And she, and she just would go all day. And I remember times where I would start like hiding the shots under the couch. I would pour the shots out under the couch because I would be so drunk, but she'd keep feeding them to me. And I remember like going to the bathroom and just crying or crying in the shower going, you know, why am I doing this? I felt so stuck. And I went from 160 pounds to 240 pounds. And I was pre-diabetic and I had chronic fatigue and it got to the point where I hurt my neck so bad I couldn't lift my head naturally. And I'm in this abusive relationship and then she nearly kills me. And I wake up one day going, what the fuck have I done? I in no way, shape or form love myself. I'm not acting like I love myself. Everything I'm doing to my body is harmful. So on October 6th, I completely stopped drinking with her, completely stopped and got sober. And so when I talk about it for three years, I was an alcoholic. I drank every day. I didn't drink because I couldn't stop myself. I drank because I did not want to be sober with this woman who was so verbally abusive and controlling. And I'm very thankful that my, because that I, I was a total alcoholic. When you look at the definition of alcoholism, yep, yep. I was a total alcoholic. Um, I don't have an issue with alcohol. I can go and I can have a drink or I could have four. Um, I may not feel that great after four, but um but I can drink, I have that ability. So when I say that I was an alcoholic for three years, I try to be very careful because I understand alcoholism is something that doesn't, you don't cure it. It's a challenge. Like my bipolar is a challenge. I can never cure it. Yep. Um, and so I'm really careful when I talk about my alcoholism because I feel like it's, it's very different. I'm very blessed that I, again, I have that thing where if, once I make that decision, I'm done with it. Like, boom, because I have that much grit i suppose i'm not sure not to say that other people it should be easy like that because it's not it takes forever to finally make that fucking oh, choice fuck yeah. fuck fucking yeah. forever i was with this <laughs> abusive female that literally cheated on me from day one and i stayed with her for six years we act like it's the hardest choice ever and then when we make the choice and we've separated ourselves fully from it like even two three weeks we go holy shit why didn't i do that forever ago because again, we build it up in our minds. We build it. I can never be without this person and I'll have to sacrifice. When I, when she beat me the first time, she beat me three times. When she beat me the first time, I realized that we shared a house together. We, we worked at the same place. We shared a car. We shared a bank account. She had completely caved me. I, I had completely caved me. I, I won't ever blame all of her. It was very much a me and her situation. And I realized I wasn't allowed to have friends, didn't have my own money, didn't have my own transportation. And so that's actually when I started my e-commerce business on the side. I was working for a liquidation company and I started flipping on eBay. And at first they were cool with it. I had permission from them, but then I started making like four grand a week and they were paying me like 1600 every two weeks so it really didn't make sense for me to have this job i was also working for them six days a week and making them a fuck ton of money and finally they got upset and he wanted to fire me and i quit but it was in that moment that i realized i'm making four thousand dollars a week i got my i bought myself a a, a a 99 lexus suv with cash i got myself an office and one day i woke up and i was like i have a paypal account i'm making my own money i have my own car i have an office I'm getting 
fuck out of here. And I lived in my office and I didn't have my own private bathroom. And I left everything, like everything in that house I had bought, everything. The car that was hers, I made all the payments on it. I paid it off and I left all of it because I didn't care because all of that wasn't worth it because I nearly died. She nearly killed me. So I, I left and I made sacrifices again. I slept in my office and eventually got out and got my own place again because sometimes you got to make those sacrifices. People are so uncomfortable in their situation, but they would rather be uncomfortable staying than uncomfortable in a different situation. Like yeah. I was uncomfortable, but guess what? I was free. Yeah, I didn't have my own private bathroom, but shit, I got me a Planet Fitness membership and was showering there. Like, again, we want to create all these excuses because we are traumatized or we think that we're not worth it or we think we don't have the tools when really it's it's taking that first step and being like, I'm not going to accept this anymore. Yeah. And the thing about it is, is the people, if they're going to sit there and critique about you living in a certain situation, they're not the right one for you anyways. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and here's the thing. Nobody knew that I was living in my office. It wasn't like I was like, hey, everyone, I'm living in my office. And these were also the days way before all my success. This was before my finance company. Um, this led me into coaching and consulting. It helped. It allowed me to create my my first few training courses. And like that was in 2007 early 2007. And so from there, I mean, shoot, I've coached 3000 people worldwide in my lending company. We've served 17,000 people. We're going to reach 1 billion in approvals in 2023. Like I'm proud of myself. And honestly, I'm impressed by myself because again, go back to little Ashley and all that she went through. I mean, I, and I have it on my hand being a suicide survivor. And even five years ago was my last attempt. And I was in a really dark place. And again, I was unmedicated and I was super popular on Facebook and I was making a lot of money and all these people were relying on me. And I took two weeks off for my health. And during that time, my students turned their backs on me, stole my stuff, created their own thing, which was just a copy of me. And they were almost like, we don't need you anymore. And that spiraled me because I was in a, a vulnerable spot and I was in Philadelphia and I I, you know, put my gun to my head. You're going to have to do a suicide warning on this one. But I put the gun to my head and I was seconds away. Um, yeah. But I, I made the definitive choice. I didn't text anyone. I didn't write any letters. I sat in my car for four hours and I made the choice. It's going to happen now. I'm, I'm so sick of giving to others all the time because that's what I was doing because that's what I've always done since I was six. Give to everyone. Give to everyone. Make everyone happy. It was never about Ashley. And a few seconds away and one of my students called me and my, my phone was up on the on the, the prop and literally my guns to my head and literally about to pull the trigger and I see my phone ringing and the first thing I think of is oh my gosh I hope something's okay even in that moment so I answer the phone is everything okay she's like no are you okay something told me I needed to call you right now and I'm crying I didn't tell her I did not tell her for two years what was going on on that phone call because I didn't want to put it on someone else. It took yeah. me two years to finally go, Hey, I have something major to tell you. Like you saved my life. And I put her lips on my, on my wrist. Cause she's my angel. She saved my life. And there was a purpose though. I was supposed to get through that. Um, and it's scary thinking about it. Like I, I get a little clammy. I get sweaty. Sometimes I get misty eyed thinking about how close I was to making such a huge definite choice it, I mean it was major and the universe had bigger plans for me you fast forward five years now I'm helping even more people you know my company does lending but I've saved lives I've helped other parents connect with their kids that are struggling um, I've helped kids talk to their damn parents um, I've had plenty of people telling me like your lives and you being so transparent about your struggle, like it saved me, it helped me, you saved my life. Or, you know, I, I've helped people get off drugs. I've, 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 I'm, I know they did all the work and I don't want to take away from them, but yeah. I have, <clears throat> I have been that person that said, you know what? I remember there was this boy, I, I call him a boy because he was younger than me. It was this boy I worked with at Nissan. 
uh, and everyone made fun of him. They all thought he was gay, so they made fun of that. And then he lost his dad. And when he lost his dad, he became shattered and he started using fentanyl and he would use it at work. So he would just be out of it, snotting and everyone would just be laughing at him. And one day I was like, I'm sick of this. I went up to him and I'm like crying and I'm like, I'm afraid you're going to die. And I don't want you to die. I'm going to get misty. I just saying it. I was like, I love you so much. I don't know you, but I love you so much. And you matter more than this. And it, it changed him. He stopped. He totally stopped. And it was just, you know, I've lost a cousin to fentanyl. So it, like that shit's serious. That shit's so fucking serious. And so I, I love and appreciate my strength that I can share these things. Uh, I get made fun of for um, talking about having bipolar. I get made fun of for my suicide attempts. Um, I get made fun of for being gay. I'm called he, she a lot. I was called he, she the other day. And I don't care. I don't care about any of that because it's going to reach one person and change their life forever. So the people that want to call me a he, she, or say that I'm ugly or uh, just the stupid, the dykey comments, just the hateful things that come out of those hurt people will never stop me from doing what I'm doing. Like it will never silence. They want me silenced. I had people say, you don't want to tell people you're bipolar. They won't want to do business with you. Oh, fucking everyone's got messed up shit. I was like, you know what? If, <laughs> and it's someone's choice. If they decide to not go with me because I have bipolar, that's fine. But unfortunately, they're going to go to someone else that probably doesn't have their best interests at heart. Absolutely. So it's it's on that same thing for not having a college degree. A few years ago, someone said they didn't want to get a loan from me because I didn't go to college. And I well, was like, I mean, I mean, they could send them my way and they could pay for my college degree. That's fine. <laughs> right. Everyone's talking about these student loan forgiveness. I'm like, what's a student loan? <laughs> oh, no, I have a. So I was the one that actually forged my parents handwriting. So I would take the original copy that my mom mm -hmm. put on the loan. And back in the day, we had the scanners and shit for the computer. So I saved it. Yeah. Every time I want another loan, I printed it, put it up against my dorm room wall. Yeah. Yeah forged her signature sent it out and i'd get a phone call she'd be like yo like did you do another application oh and my gosh that's great someone yeah. fucking got a shitload of student loan debt because someone didn't understand that that the income ratio back in the day right yeah we don't really think about what's going to happen in four or five years that's not typically how we're built when we're younger no i, <laughs> I bought some of these young kids are i'm like you're really mature for 22 <laughs> i'm like Fuck, no no I no I, I didn't mature till i was like i still didn't even mature now i mean now now i know briefly who i am at times like there's still yeah. days like you and i where we struggle but uh, there's also days where like uh, when i was volunteering last week i was we're volunteering at the pantry and everyone's like oh my it's a pantry i'm like Kids, dude's like dude you're in the kid pantry i'm like hell yeah let's go like he's like you okay with that i'm like yeah give me all the fucking kids i don't care like yeah it's it's so it's so sad how because of social media how much we honestly forget how to be a human to people just be fun yeah so like for me um i i have been a, a primary influence in in two teenage boys lives and I remember when I first met them, they were nine and 11. Um, and we would go to a restaurant and I would always talk to the waiter or waitress with their first name. Be like, hey, Jake, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And the boys were like, how do you know everyone? And I'm like, I don't know everyone. They're like, but like y'all were talking like your best friends. And I said, you see that? I said, watch me with everyone. I said, when you acknowledge a person i'm teaching this to a nine and 11 year old when you acknowledge someone you're unlocking something i was like these people they they get treated like below us because they're serving us but they're actually above us in some ways so you always want to go out of your way and acknowledge and you know these boys watch me give to homeless people and volunteer at soup kitchens like i do a lot for the community but i don't take the social media picture and show it off um, and so teaching these boys, I got to the point where then the boys would see a homeless person and be like, Ashley, do you have money? We need to give them money. And I'm like, yes, you get it now. Like, I feel good. But then I was giving a lot of my money out. They're like, we got to give them more money. <laughs> I was like, calm down, calm down. Yeah, no, okay. no. Someone's got to make more here. Come on. I'm like, I like y'all. Y'all look good. It's not your money. So you're good with it. But like this year, um, 
uh, a, a female that I went to school with, she does these Christmas drives every year. And um, they, they had a few more children to sponsor. So I was like, I need to sponsor a child because I'm literally sponsoring somebody that was me growing up in my hometown. And it's, I'm from Peru, Maine. Um, I, I make a joke all the time. I'm from Peru. They're like, oh, South America. I'm like, no, Maine. Yeah. Um, but you're, I, I remember I, a I, lot more, you know, bright skin girl. <laughs> yeah. We real, we real bright over here. Um, so like I donated like $200 or something like that. I'm like, is that enough? And she was like, yes. And then she came back and she was like, this girl is actually from Peru. So you are legit giving back to a little me and I was just like yes I, I like I love that so much because I used to not have two hundred dollars to give anyone <laughs> let alone myself so I love that I live a life now where I didn't go to college but I make more than most people do who went to college I'm able to offer something that truly helps people G giving loans it's not just about the money like I'm helping people start their dream business or a business they've been wanting to do I help people become more comfortable in that business I've helped people get their dream home or go on vacation or put their kids through college I've helped people get surgeries uh, I have helped people <laughs> getting the, uh, stop their home from getting foreclosed on like it's a um, and then during COVID was insane I was working 90 hours a week during COVID and it was so draining and every single conversation was just a business owner crying and desperate. And they're like, I don't know how I'm going to keep my doors open. And that was just an insane time to be literally the lifeline. Like we oh, were oh, one oh. of, oh, yeah. Keep going. I was no, going to we say, were... you could use no. your experience with that because you were econ before you went into that. Yes, that was the other thing too. And I really attribute my past businesses and success to lending. So I am very special. I tell that to people. I, I like to study and learn anything I can. So I'm very and, hyperactive too in the, in the room coming from yeah. experience. <laughs> It's a part of the bipolar, which I didn't realize, which again has a trip. Like as a child, I studied the baseball encyclopedia so I could just name off, you know, yep. that Hank Aaron had seven, you know, <laughs> Babe Ruth had 714 home runs and Michael Jordan batted a 202. And <laughs> like, I can just say all these crazy things. And what I didn't realize is how impactful that is for business. So anything I get into, I'm going to be that sponge and I'm going to learn as much as possible. So starting in e-com, learned as much as possible. And then I had other people begging me, teach me how you do it. And I'm like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to teach you exactly how I do it. Not, oh, I'm going to keep the secret sauce to myself. I'm like, here you go. And what was funny back in 2017, my two training programs one was my eBay training was $250, super cheap, <laughs> one time. And then my, my big training um, thing, I connected with an affiliate program called Easy Cash Code, <laughs> ECC. And it was a $17, $17 one-time payment with two upsells for $47 and $97. So I decided instead of just selling this, I'm going to sell this and anyone that buys it will get access to my training group. And I will teach you how to utilize it, how to sell it, how to create a business and really market and sell anything, the right way to speak to people. I did all this. So within two months for 17 bucks, I was teaching 1200 people what others were teaching half of in their $10,000 programs. So I started getting all these coaches sliding into my inbox, literally threatening my life, saying the grossest things online. My poor grandma was like, I'm worried for your life. I'm like, Graham, these little boys aren't going to hurt me. Plus I care. I'm my daddy's daughter. We're good. Okay. I'm a very good shot, but they were pissed because I was, I was training them and giving them more information than the $10,000 programs. So I became really popular and very hated at the same time, depending on which group you looked at. And, um, and, and, that's... and, and, and I'm going to say, I'm a classified. There is two groups and I'm learning it this year that especially the further along we get in this journey, you have, and I'm not, you know, let's just say the boys out West. We'll just use that. Yeah. There's a few States out there that will filter the information from each level up to the top versus yeah. like how we are. We're just like, all right, this is what it is. Fucking, let's I'm going to tell them, I am one of the few 
people that own a loan brokerage that teaches you exactly how to open and run a successful loan brokerage. Like I just released, I revamped my loan brokerage training and I have a lender list. And in it is a lender list of these are the ones you want to work with. And these are the ones you absolutely don't want to work with. I'm like, I'm going to get in so much trouble for this, but I don't care. Um, and so I had a, one of my first students, Jude, after he purchased the training, he said, Ashley, he said, because right now it's on sale for $1,111. I'm all about angel numbers. He said, Ashley, I just purchased a training two months ago for $2,500. He goes, and all it was was a lender list. And the lender list was literally just affiliate links. Nothing else. I'm like, oh my gosh, these people are getting away with murder. That's nothing. I'm like, my loan brokerage training goes over legal setup, what offers you should pick, why you should pick them, hard, how to target. Then it goes over all the programs and the underwriting rules. Literally every loan brokerage training doesn't go over underwriting rules. How can you sell loans if you don't know the rules? Then I go over how to actually sell the offers, how, how to do discovery calls, how to help them afterwards. No training does that. I'm like, how can y'all have a loan brokerage training without this? What are you training them on? But they're not. And, and really the other scary part, remember I said, there's really only like five people on the top of everything. I like to think that I'm on top. Um, and I know the four other people. If you don't go with one of us five, all these other people that do loans that are funding experts, they literally have no idea what they're talking about. Before we got on this call, I was on Instagram and this chick has tens of thousands of followers and the first part was uh, it was five or six no doc loans and then the second screen goes with all the no doc loans and it's literally ev every single option you have to submit docs a ton of docs i screenshotted it because i'm like i'm gonna use this as an example again but literally everything she said i'm like documents are required for all of these. And in fact, I can rattle off every single document each one of these lenders wants for what you're pretending is a no doc loan. So we have thousands of these business credit coaches and thousands of these funding experts giving out information that I have no idea where they even got it from. I have no idea. And it's not right. <laughs> like legit. Not, I was like, this is completely incorrect. And so, you know, I, I clarify information like that. I also still call out scammers and they get really pissed when I call them out. Like I have this group of two girls that really, really, really don't like me. And they are on this, they're hell bent to let everyone know I'm a racist, which if anyone actually knows me, <laughs> you're they're going to be like, are you sure, Ashley? Ashley? Are you sure about that? <laughs> yeah, um, I know. I mean, you'll call, no. you'll, you'll call out teachers, but that teacher was your best friend. So it's not. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I will call these people out and they're so mad. So they're, they're, on, they're on this thing that I'm a racist. And I'm like, I didn't want to talk about it for a while because I'm like, they're below me and it's lies. So you don't have, I don't need to explain myself. But then I started getting a lot of people messaging me going, I just saw in the group that these people are calling you a racist and saying your business is, is racist and that they target black women. And I'm like, I guess I need to make a statement again because this is just crazy. And what's even crazier is these two women have scammed people out of hundreds of thousands of dollars and they are scamming the majority of melanin people. So I'm like, if y'all want to call me racist, look up, look, find anything. Find anything where I've ever said or done anything racist. Like, I am actually the one that's going on marches for Black Lives Matter. Like, I'm the ally. And not to be, like, mistook as, like, a white Jesus or coming in to save the melanin people. I am not that. But I also understand I have certain white privilege. And I can do and be impactful in positive ways. So, like, if you even go back to 2017 again... I used to speak out a lot about certain things and it was definitely a very pro black thing. And my grandmother and people started begging me to stop because they thought I was literally going to get murdered because I would get white people in such an uproar about some of the stuff that I was sharing. I would literally have people being like, I'm going to fly into Nashville and murder you. And my grandma's like, you got to stop. And I'm like, they want me to stop though. That's the thing. Yep. is I'm making these people uncomfortable because I'm letting them know about themselves. And if I 
remain silent, I am just as bad as them. Like I'm just as bad. And once you know the truth, like for me, again, from the time I was six, I had to protect. I had to protect everyone. I had to protect my mom. I had to protect my sister. I had to protect myself. So I'm a, a natural protector. And when I see anyone being taken advantage of for literally a made up reason, because you think you're better or entitled or whatever this weird shit is, because it's 2022 people. Oh, I get fucking like, furious. Yeah, I, I, I have no time for that. I've been fired from jobs because I have... I used to work with um, many African women and they would come in all their outfits and they would bring in their food. And I remember we had this dude that was a manager and he, he stood over this girl and made fun of her Ethiopian bread, calling it SpongeBob and she's crying. And I get up and I'm like, I won't repeat it all because I don't really know your audience, but I was just like, look him. I get called into the office because I started. So I get right up. I said, so you're y'all not going to do anything about this dude. Well, then there were these two other girls that started making fun of, the African ladies on, on the, and of course I'm friends with them. I'm going to eat with them. Come over. You're safe here. You're safe here. You're protected here. You're welcome here. You're accepted a thousand percent. And I think that's because I never felt accepted that I'm so committed and focused on making sure other people are accepted because I never felt accepted. And even now I don't feel accepted, but I realize I don't care. Like yeah, I accept yeah. me. So I'm good, you know? But I stood up for these girls, too, and, and these other girls were saying the nastiest things to these girls, and it was disgusting. So finally, I decided, because I can be nasty, too, I started saying the nastiest stuff to them back. Well, they reported me, and I got called into the office again, and they're like, we heard you're saying these. And I was like, huh, that's weird. I was like, I don't recall saying any of those things I said, but you know what? Did anyone mention what they were saying to the two? And I started telling them. They didn't care. They were like, well, <laughs> we're going to write you up. And if you do this again, you're fired. And I said, actually, I'm going to quit. And all y'all are racist. And I walked out. I did that my previous job where uh, yes. he's like, oh, we're going to write you up. We're going to write you up. I'm like, so why don't you just place that in my file? <laughs> he's yeah. like, when me, and, he, and I'm like, you probably got like a fucking folder where you just dry yeah. that out. And it's like, Chad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right up, right up. Um, if I, if I I have a hard time not saying something when I deem something is wrong. And I say when I deem, you know, we all make our choices of what we deem as right and wrong. I, I have my code of conduct. I won't change. Um, I am mindful in certain situations that I put myself in. Like um, when I was living in Houston uh, last year, or early this year, um, I heard neighbors fighting, screaming bloody murder. You have to be mindful when you put yourself in that situation. I quietly got my gun. I put it in my hoodie. Just walked outside. Was like, everybody me, good? Sir. You don't, yeah. <laughs> you don't show the gun because that's starting something. You just make see. Everybody good? Okay, everybody good. I'm gonna go back over here now. You know, I am mindful because like I don't need to be killed. You know, standing up for what is right. But I'm definitely gonna make sure that if I'm able to, I'm gonna stop the situation as much as I can. Oh, I, was, I was gonna say Houston, like everyone's got one plus two in their car. So, <laughs> but I so have family I, down I there, so some... I can I can rip on that a little bit. Listen, man, I, that apartment complex was crazy. One day, this dude, you could tell he was high on meth or whatever. Real skinny dude, you could tell he probably hasn't showered a while. He's pushing this cart, and I want to say it was in. I don't think it was an AK forty seven, but it was definitely a very maybe an AR-15. It was very similar, right? And I see him and he's trying to take the gun apart and he's hitting it on the fucking ground, but like at his face. And so I'm just sitting there watching. I'm like, this is going to get good. I might see him blow his whole head off. I just watched. Nothing happened. But I was like, that is the craziest way I've ever seen someone disassemble a gun. And it's absolutely not the way of doing it. I didn't I didn't help him though I was like I'm gonna let him have this one <laughs> yeah and I was gonna say we're like I said me and you could go forever but there's one rule that I'm gonna say it this way is all of us there's a there's a a, a pattern between all of us in this industry or anyone that's construction any entrepreneurship business ownership we don't care who you are we don't care where you're from yep. if you show up you show up we're gonna we're gonna shake your hand when you make it to the top and we're gonna yep. be your coach all the way up to the top yeah. And, and we all fucking hate taxes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
we all hate that that no that is something everyone i think can get that brings people together <laughs> right there <laughs> that's gonna be the one that's yeah, how we and, bridge the gap here people <laughs> and and there's a reason why we kind of sway on one side on the old uh yep pal- i know and ballot, you know what but that's that's the reason why because we hate taxes and and me being gay you would not believe how I have been bullied and mistreated for certain political beliefs. They're like, what? I'm like, I'm sorry. And I think you heard me say this. The gays and the vegans, they don't pay me to promote, okay? I do not get paid to recruit for the gays. So I don't know why you mad at me with my political beliefs because you literally don't even know what you're talking about. You're basing all of the choices you're making on social media and you're also poor. You're poor and you're an employee. So your life is very different than mine. And what you think is best for you actually isn't best for me. And so you can have what's best for you over there. But I want you to know what's best for you hurts everybody else. Yeah, It hurts small businesses, which is the lifeline of everything. It kind of hurts big corporations only because of its employees that are being hurt. So you're just hurting the entire ecosystem. But that's cool. Be mad at me because I was supposed to be whatever because I happen to be a lesbian. That's cute. <laughs> well, well and, and I was going to say it goes, it's, and the reason why uh, you and most of our friends in that circle get along great because I have a, I have a farm background. So like now they're, yeah. they want to throw the green, whatever, we're not going to get political here, but they're trying <laughs> to tax yeah. the carbon yeah. coming off the ground. I'm like, what the, like, really guys? Like, fucking hey you know they're all, the this f- is, they're, you know everyone's <laughs> sitting around going you know we got to figure out how we can tax oxygen that's the next step let's figure that one out and then some freaking old son of a bitch in the corner going oh yeah we can use the money and and wait a minute oh hey hey can we funnel it back to us <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah like i'll i'll own the oxygen let's figure out how we can evenly distribute oxygen shares among all of us and make a frig ton of money sounds good to me <laughs> you know i, I i'm not totally <laughs> mad at them for it i i am cool to study what they do and and join because here's the deal you can be mad about it or you could figure you out play how the you fucking game it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we all gotta we all gotta utilize these things like i'm not mad at trump i study trump I've been studying Trump for years. I'm not mad at him. And listen, Trump's said a lot of hateful things towards my people. But at least he says it to our face. If, if you, I'll say and, that all day. Yeah, and I will explain it this way because I, I'm with you guys on it because you block where he ran for president where everyone kind of went spiral backwards. So like the book, We Want You Rich, where he wrote with Kiyosaki. Mm-hmm. Um, you just kind of go all the way back to like the 70s. So like you you have to go backwards with him. Yeah. And you notice you're like, dude, that dude is fucking brilliant. Everything Trump does, he does with purpose. Yes. And a lot of people don't and a lot of people don't really truly understand the big picture. And a lot of regular people, non-business owners don't understand marketing or PR like every, every single thing Trump said blew up and everyone the dude was talking can play about the it. media like. a film. Yes. Yes. And every single negative thing about him, he lived off from it. Like, he literally showed you that the whole world can pretend to hate you. He was still feeling himself. He was still the best. (laughs) I'm the best. We're making America great again. Like, this is some false news. This is some fake news. They're lying to you. Check it out. I'm like, this motherfucker on point, though. Like, (laughs) I know y'all don't like the packaging, but I'm going to let you know Hillary Clinton probably uses the N-word more than Trump does. So we can talk about that, but y'all don't want to talk about that because y'all would rather have them say a bunch of crazy shit in secret instead of Trump being like, I'm not going to keep this a secret. I'm going to tweet it. <laughs> no, no. Then they just, you know, rig election against their own selves in Georgia. Right? But we just keep that quiet. <laughs> Well, this, and, uh, this is the last thing I'll say about Trump, because I've been saying it for a while. Everyone was so mad when Trump got elected. And I said, what people don't realize is Trump is an exact representation of America as a whole in the 2020s, in the social media age, in all of that. Trump is the reflection of America. Everything that America is, Trump has represented in one way or the other. Absolutely. Completely. Trophy we can, wife. Yeah. Oh, trophy wife, making all the money, 
being, I mean, this dude was a celebrity and he became president. Talk about be whatever you want to be, man. People say, I want to grow up and be an astronaut. Shit, you can be now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know elon sending people to mars we can literally do fucking anything and y'all are mad at him for it. y'all mad that he didn't pay taxes i'm yeah. proud of you bro <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sitting there going i'm like shit you should give your accountant a raise <laughs> right or like, and like people mad at bezos i'm like yo have y'all not been paying attention this whole time this is all that those fat white men been doing since the dawn of time y'all mad at america america started with slaves man and wearing wigs they all wore wigs and weird dresses <laughs> well, we don't want to talk about that <laughs> well, well and, and i'm just and i don't know if you saw dave Chappelle stand up where he was on i mean SNL. i've seen i've seen a good amount and i actually really liked his stand up about the gays and the transgenders that had me rolling yeah he was he was talking about because he, he brought up the trump situation about like how they're all trying to come back and he's like he's like he's like oh you didn't pay taxes he's like because i played the game you played yeah, like <laughs> come on y'all study oh, the playbook and all you guys you can't that be mad rip on... at the player like yeah, come like, on it's like you guys want to be mad at it's, dave chappelle stand there. up you need to shut the fuck oh. up <laughs> and that's and and here's the thing and i do struggle a little bit because listen i'm a cancer i'm an empath i am sensitive and i do like to be sensitive to other people's traumas or hurts or pains mm -hmm. now that's not going to put me to the point where i'm walking on eggshells but i do like to be aware so like for me again i'm full of tattoos and i'm a lesbian and you can tell so i understand not everyone in society is going to be comfortable with me. Mm -hmm. I've literally been sitting down at a coffee shop and there was a group of four grandmas and one of them said, I can't sit next to that. And I was the that. And I was just thinking, you don't realize how charming and sweet I am, grandma. People have that right. Everyone has that right. And that's not a reflection of me. That's the thing is we want to make everything about us that actually isn't about us. And the time we need to make it about us, we're making it about somebody else. And that's where the confusion is with self-care and, and going out and all that other stuff. But it's like, I know I'm not going to be welcome in every single group. And that's okay. That doesn't bother me. What I think is magical, though, is when you connect with someone that typically wouldn't be someone that you would connect with random older white women on a plane that's just like oh my gosh you're so much fun I'm like thanks girl like you or like these super Christian people that like I get a little scared around Christians I've had I've had my own issues <laughs> I Again, am a Christian mean, and I go to church every a lot listen, and I get scared <laughs> they right they look at me and they're like are you lost I'm like so sorry this isn't a strip club my bad <laughs> which I've never been to a strip club but um I what I love so much about it is when you connect with those people that you would think wouldn't be like the Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg. Like everyone's like, that's so crazy. How did they get together? I'm like, it actually works out perfectly when you think about it. But no one would think that would go together. So I do love putting myself out there, not worrying, you know, am I going to be judged? Am I going to be accepted? No, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to light up the whole room because I'm a friggin Christmas tree like I go into a room, I'm talking to everybody, even if they don't want to talk to me, <laughs> I'm going to talk to them. We're going to find commonality or not. I'm going to see in the room who's with me and who's not. And the people that aren't with me, I'm not mad about that. That's their right. Just like I have the right to be like, no, thank you. This isn't a thing. <laughs> like we don't oh, yeah, have any. You could be the loudest comments. student in the corner too. So. Right. Exactly. But that's, I love <laughs> connecting with people that I wouldn't normally think would be cool with me and I like that it feels good because it's like I appreciate your openness because a lot of people are so scared to be open and so I think that yeah right like yeah, I built a fucking brand on that what you... right like heaven oh. forbid you're friends with a gay person I might make you gay or heaven forbid you know you like black people like that's terrible like it blows my mind the ignorance of like we're humans I'm a human here i'm gonna let a little secret people who cares right well and and that is when you realize the who cares and it's not the who cares in a toxic way like fuck all y'all i no, don't no, no. need you it's not like that because then that's that's the extreme it's the who cares of you have every right like i have every right i have every right to go where i want to go and if it, like during covid i was not a mask wearer 
I wasn't going to be. Again, I'm my dad's daughter. We're not going to do it. That was my right. And when I would go into stores and they would want me to wear a mask, that's their right. And so if they were forceful about it, I would just be like, thank you. Have a good day. I didn't need to make a big stink about it. Mm -hmm. I have my rights. They have theirs. If they want to put three masks on and think that that protects them, placebos work all the time. Go for it. bro. <laughs> but we all have these choices and we can, cr we have all the power and control to create our life. Now I understand some people are employees, so they, or they're, they're going to school. So they have to deal with some people they don't like, but you don't have to acknowledge that yucky energy. That doesn't have to bother you. So if you are working or having to be next to people that you can't, like, it just doesn't work, protect yourself with that. But beyond that, we literally have the option to wear what we want to wear, eat what we want to eat. I don't care how poor we are. Like I said, I've been home. I've been homeless four times. Okay. okay. We all have, we all have no, the choice. Not like, that. Sorry. Sorry. Let me talk. No, you're that. good. <laughs> I just say we all like we we don't realize it. And I think it's because people haven't given us permission, but we absolutely have permission to live our entire life the way the fuck we want. You can work where you want to work. If you hate your job, find a job you won't hate. If you if you have a I, oh, I said this earlier today. Anyone can have a mediocre boyfriend or girlfriend. <clears throat> exactly. Mediocrity is everywhere. You can have. For me, it's a girlfriend. I can have a girlfriend that doesn't support me, that cheats on me, that doesn't show up for me. I can find that 9.9 .9 times out of 10. And for men, y'all can, can be with women that use and abuse you or, or you could be single. Why do we have to be with these people, right? Like we so choose mediocrity. If you hate your job, if you hate your boss, Find a situation that works out, but you don't have to quit right there. I never suggest quitting without a plan. I mean, unless you've got some savings, go for it or leverage your credit. But like, we don't have to remain in situations that don't serve us. It blows my mind because we're not kids anymore. It's not like we're stuck at our parents' house doing whatever. We're not stuck in school. We have the choice. And what's crazy is we have we absorb all the pressures and expectations from everybody else. Well, my parents want me to do this. Fucking who cares? My parents want me to go to college. Okay. What do you want to do? Like fulfilling your parents' desires is only going to hurt you in the long run. Now you're going to have bitterness and animosity towards your parents. Now you're going to have student loan debt for no reason. You're going to go into, it's, it's the same thing with addicts. Unless you fully fucking choose that. It's not going to happen. Your mom can guilt you and cry and you can do an intervention. She can say, I love you and I don't want you to die. And that's beautiful. But it doesn't fucking matter when you're that deep into addiction. Nobody's voice, nobody's letter is going to matter except for the only one in your head. Until that time hits. And, you, and the thing with, with addicts, and I, I've, I've dated two. My first girlfriend was actually addicted to crack cocaine. She gave me my first black eye as a grown up. Uh, cheated on me and got pregnant by her drug dealer. I'm 21 years old. My first girlfriend cheats on me with her drug dealer and gets pregnant. <laughs> That's a damn, I'm telling you, I'm gonna sell my story to Netflix one day. Um, but it just like, we, I accepted that. We accept that. We accept so much. And then one day we've had enough. It's always that pushing point. And a lot of us have to hit rock bottom to be, to have the hand that forced us most addicts overdose or lose everything and lose their kids and sometimes it still takes time because you got to figure it out it doesn't matter you can lose everything it's still right in here and people think well you lost your kid and you lost your job why do you still why are you it's it's not that easy it's not no, that no. easy no. no it's not but it's it only happens when you make that choice and you've got to make that's why they say one day at a time because you have to make that choice every single day and sometimes you got to do it 10 15 times a day absolutely and then you're gonna have friends that are going to try to get you to get back on the wagon because they think yes yes all you and i'm gonna me and you could tap into this right here but um we're gonna end it so let's I love I'm, gonna, it, I'm gonna bring you back it, me and you could go forever and i love be, this man there might be a few things coming down the road too uh, speaking of that i know you got these <laughs> secrets and i like it 
it might be <laughs> it might be brewing into a two day thing. We might be. I, I'm gonna say it like this, Chad, and you don't have to edit this out. You just let me know where I need to be, and I'm gonna show up <laughs> <All right. laughs> anytime, anywhere, Chad. I'm gonna show up for you, man. I like you a lot.